In 1979, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky published a paper called Prospect Theory, an Analysis of Decision Under Risk. It's widely regarded that this was the moment that the modern field of behavioral economics was born and it earned Daniel Kahneman a Nobel Prize. So why was this paper so important? What was contained within it that led to the birth of a whole new field of economics? Well, today I'm going to try and explain it at five different levels, and that's the first level covered off already, basic facts. Let's jump into level two. So, why was prospect theory so revolutionary to economics? Well, it was really the first time that we saw reference points introduced to economic models. Let me explain what that means. Imagine you had two people, Gary and Steve. Gary has £5,000 while Steve has £15,000. They both go and make investments and after one year they end up with £10,000 each. Now according to utility theory, which is what dominated economics prior to prospect theory, both of these people should be equally happy with the amount of money they have. After all, they both have the same amount of money, they both have the same amount of buying power in the real world. But you and I know that these two people aren't just as happy as each other. Gary is far happier that he's gained £5,000 and Steve is distraught at the fact that he lost £5,000. So that's why prospect theory was revolutionary because it accounted for these differences in its model. What Kahneman and Tversky were arguing was that the amount that people value things changes depending on what their reference point is. Somebody who's gaining money is gonna be a lot happier than somebody who's losing money. But are gains and losses experienced at the same rate? Well, to explain that, let's jump into level three. For level three, we're looking at whether gains and losses are experienced equally. To understand it, you just need to remember one key phrase, which is losses loom larger than gains. And if you're interested in behavioral economics, I recommend you commit that phrase to memory. All that means in practice is that the pain of losing is far more intense than the pleasure of gaining. Steve, who lost 5,000 pounds, is feeling far worse than Gary is feeling happy about gaining 5,000 pounds. And this has strong implications for people's risk-taking behavior. Imagine your friend challenges you to a game of FIFA and the wager is £10. Play one game and he beats you and then he says, I'll challenge you double or nothing. Do you take the bet? Well, because we feel the pain of losing far more than the pleasure of gaining, you're actually more likely to take it. In order to try and avoid that negative emotion, you're willing to take bigger risks. Which is why when it comes to losses, people can act very irrationally. Rather than just cutting their losses and going home, instead they end up doubling down and end up losing more money than they actually would have. But is this effect constant and consistent across all different levels of gains and losses? Well, to explain that, we need to go to level four. All right, so for level four, I need to do something which is like a cardinal sin on YouTube. So please don't click off the video, but I'm about to show you a graph. And the graph I'm gonna show you is right there. Okay, so this is my graph. And as you can see, I have four different labels. We go from less money to more money, and awesome to sucks. Uh, these are of course the original labels that were used on the Nobel Prize winning paper. Now what this curved line represents is how you feel at different levels of gain and losses. And you'll notice that, well, it's curved and it flattens out at a certain point. What this tells you is that gaining money is only enjoyable up to a certain point and then past that your emotional response is pretty much the same. And in the same way, losing money also flattens out. Losing money sucks until a certain point and then it can't really suck any more than it already does. For example, imagine you were to win a thousand pounds. How would you feel? You probably feel pretty good. But what if you were to win a hundred thousand pounds? Well now you probably feel even better. But what if you were to win a hundred and one thousand pounds? How would that make you feel? Well for some reason winning a hundred and one thousand pounds doesn't feel that different to just winning a hundred thousand pounds even though you're a thousand pounds richer. And that's kind of what prospect theory shows us, is that as the amount of money we gain gets larger, we become less sensitive to those incremental gains and we get to a point where winning more money doesn't really make us much happier. Now let's look at losses. Imagine you were to lose a thousand pounds. How would you feel? Probably pretty bad. But what if you were to lose a hundred thousand pounds? Well, now you feel terrible. A hundred thousand pounds is a lot of money to lose. But what if you were to lose a hundred and one thousand pounds? Would you feel much worse than losing a hundred thousand pounds? Well, again, probably not. Losing a hundred and one thousand pounds for some reason doesn't feel that different to losing a hundred thousand pounds. 
And again, this is what prospect theory shows us, that as the amount of money we lose gets larger, we become less sensitive to how much we're losing, and we get to a point where losing more money simply can't feel worse than it already does. So that's prospect theory at level four. So for level five, we're gonna look beyond the original paper and see some of the more recent research that has come out about prospect theory since. And what we find in more recent research is that prospect theory mainly only applies to decisions that are being made for the first time or that are made rarely. In situations where the decision maker has made this decision hundreds of times beforehand and they have much more experience, they seem to behave in a much more rational way, weighing up gains and losses more equally and engage in risk-taking behaviors more appropriately. To explain, let's use that example of your friend challenging you to a game of FIFA, just because it's a bit of a silly example. So your friend challenges you to a game of FIFA, he beats you and you owe him 10 pounds, and then he says double or nothing. And because you don't wanna make that loss and you're subject to prospect theory that we just talked about, you say, yes, I'll double or nothing, and then he beats you again and now you owe him 20 pounds. So you pay him 20 pounds, you go home, but then the next day the same thing happens, he says, I'm gonna challenge you to a game of FIFA and I'll bet you 10 pounds that I can beat you. And then again, you play him and you lose. And then he says double or nothing. Now do you take the double or nothing again? Well, you're actually less likely to. And the more that this situation occurs again and again and again, the more information you gain about how this market works, about your chances and about how your decisions affect your outcomes, your financial outcomes. And so therefore you become a better decision maker. You have more information, you learn how the market works and therefore you can weigh up your risk appropriately. So that's what more modern economists like Graham Looms who lectured me at Warwick are finding. When people engage in a repeated market, they have more information over the decision that they make and how their decisions affect their outcomes, they actually weigh up their prospects much more rationally and therefore take appropriate risk-taking behaviors. So that's prospect theory explained at five different levels. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, can you please give me a thumbs up because I really appreciate it and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. And engaging in risk-taking of...